A pleasure to be here. I'm going to give you a little um, history of me and actually a story about my relationship, tenuous as it might be, to this conference. Um, back in 2013, when I was at MIT, I uh, co-chaired a workshop called MOOC Shop um, that was held at the AI and Ed conference in Memphis, AI and Education. And we had some uh, illustrious guest speakers that year, which included um, uh, Chong Du, Tom Du from Coursera, formerly at Coursera, and uh, Peter Mitros, formerly at edX, uh, to give talks. Unfortunately, we didn't take the opportunity to have them on a panel and, you know, duke it out at that time. Maybe it would have changed the whole future of MOOCs. Um, but we nevertheless had a, a quaint but illustrious uh, group of people talking here, many of which are now uh, faculty. And then sure enough, the, the next year, there was this thing called MOOCworkshop.org. Any coincidence that we had MOOCshop.org before? Um, which was, of course, the first year of learning with MOOCs and, um, of course, sparked this um, still vibrant community. And I did, part I did participate in the conference uh, uh, this year when I was at MIT. So it's really nice to be back um, and, and see things moving along uh, well. Um, and in that year, I presented work we had published on taking in intelligent tutoring system paradigms, um, like measuring fine-grained skills and trying to apply that paradigm to the first MOOC on edX, which is 6002X um, circuits and electronics. Okay, so that was my history, is going from ITS to MOOCs with this postdoc, um, and then you'll see some of the rest. So the premise of this talk is adaptivity and personalization good, but, but why do we need it? And I'll start with the question of, you know, does one size fit all with courses in general? Okay, so how about on campus? Can you have one course that is good for all majors? Maybe, it's not common, right? You'll start with a course that's for a single major, and it's usually not good the first time around, or second time, or third time. Sometimes it takes the fourth or fifth time for an instructor to get it right. That's just for their students. And then if you accept multiple majors, you have some more adaptation to do. So yes, but it takes a lot of work. What about on all campuses? You take that course, take it to a community college, even take it to another four-year institution. Is it still appropriate for those students? What about if you take it to uh, high schoolers? Is that same course still, are we still good? Um, that same course for master's degree holders, all employees. Um, what about to all MOOC users? So as we know, all MOOC users are essentially all of those categories, right? Now you could argue and you say, well, there's such thing as textbooks, right? Textbooks could be used at all levels. And I would say two things to that. One is that uh, textbooks are designed specifically, or many are, for general audiences. So the writers, the co-authors go through a lot of revisions in order to accomplish that. They're reviewed based on that criteria. Um, there's an editor that makes it so, and then there's revisions every five, ten years, something like that. Plus, the textbook was not designed to be utilized on its own without any instructors or instructional staff. So that's not exactly a counterpoint. So the problem is the average MOOC has a more diverse audience, but is less personalized than an on-campus degree satisfying course. Right? So if you have more diversity, you should want more personalization, but it's the opposite here. So this is sort of a, um, uh, a double-edged problem. So based on this, I believe more adaptation um, is needed. So the question is, can every course be designed um, or adapted specifically to each user? And what I'm going to present now is not solutions that I claim have achieved this and work really well. Um, instead, I'm going to present examples of technology that makes this more plausible, that is in use, that has been piloted. And there's some reason to believe that adaptation can work. 
there's been million dollar RAND studies of technology in K-12 using <clears throat> adaptive learning and mastery learning, and those have shown somewhere between 0.2 and 1 standard deviation of improvement. Like cognitive tutor had a 0.2 effect size improvement um, versus business as usual in eighth grade algebra. So uh, what do I mean by adaptivity? I'm going to use a, a framework um, to orient uh, you that's used by uh, Vincent Levin at CMU. So if you say, okay, what parts um, of the course can be personalized? You can say, well, you could personalize the course design, the whole thing, um, the syllabus, which is something like uh, similar to the design, the assessment problems that are shown to students, or communication can be personalized. Now, he talks about these categories in terms of intelligent tutoring systems. I've translated them uh, to the MOOC scenario. <clears throat> so then, what data is being adapted to? So what are you personalizing based on? And that could be a student prior knowledge um, profile, their path through the course up to this point, um, their affect or motivation, or self-regulated learning and metacognition, anything you would want to measure about a learner, you could personalize to. Um, but in the work that I'll show today, it's mostly based on uh, the learner's path through the course. Um, in, in this first example, um, I'll show you an adaptation of the syllabus, kind of, uh, based on a student's path through uh, a edX MOOC at Delft. So the, the idea here is that a one-size-fits-all course syllabus is implausible. And so instead, is there some kind of adapted syllabus that we can create based on data for an individual student? Now, it's a very dramatic thing to, to tell an instructor you're replacing their syllabus based on data. So I have gotten um, pushback on that. Therefore, <laughs> we take a recommendation approach to syllabus adaptation, right? We're not overriding that syllabus. Um, just at various points um, on a course page, we will say, you may want to consider this detour. So th the expert constructed um, courseware is the default syllabus. And then you have novice learners interacting with the course, and they are learning and navigating in ways that perhaps the expert did not anticipate. So we collect the event log data from the novice learners, we feed it to a model, and then create these suggestions based on a loosely filtered recommendation model. It's not exactly people who did this, did this next, like Amazon style, but it's close to that. I'll show you how it differs in uh, this slide. <clears throat> so the uh, recommendation engine here that will suggest what you might want to do next um, that veers off uh, the syllabus course um, is a model that predicts what the student is going to try to go to next based on where they've been before. And it also pays attention to how many seconds and minutes they spent on those previous pages. So you can say, okay, based on that history, make a prediction of what the student's going to do next. But doing this wouldn't be very helpful. If what you were going to do next is paginate through the course, looking for that page that gives you some information about the quiz question you're on, then our recommendation wouldn't be saving you any time um, at all. It would just be saying, you're probably going to go to this page that you're not intending to spend very much time on, and then another page that you're not spending very much time on. Um, so how we get over that is we predict the next page and how long they're anticipated to spend on it. So if we think it's five seconds, we're not going to recommend that because that looks like a transition page. Then we look again ahead and say, well, if you do go to the page that we predict, what will you go to next and how long will you spend? That's nine seconds. And so we wait until the algorithm predicts ahead for a page that the student is predicted to spend some considerable amount of time on. Let's say 30 minutes, 30 seconds, one minute, whatever you want to set that threshold to. And then that's what we recommend the page that they're anticipated to dwell on next, for better or for worse, I'll admit. So there's a technical uh, dimension to this. We have to train a model. In this case, it's a recurrent neural network architecture, um, which is a common uh, temporal model. Uh, we have to train on a, the data of a previously offered course and then make sure that we have um, 
accommodated any changes in the courseware between the previous offering and the current offering. For example, if a page was deleted, we want to make sure we're never suggesting a page that only was offered in the previous offering. Um, and then we have to enable real-time logging in edX. This doesn't exist natively. Uh, and then we have to show the recommendations in real time. Neither of those things are given to you by edX. So there's some engineering to do there. Um, and then we need to have a real time machine learning service, listening, waiting to serve up recommendations. Okay, so this is what the experience looks like when it's all put together. Uh, we inserted this suggested for you uh, link here. It says you may want to go to this history of flight video, but the learner does not actually watch the video. Uh, skips the video, goes to the quiz page, uh, doesn't know the answers, and then we say go back to the video. Because <laughs> supposedly the algorithm saw they didn't spend very much time there, and then they watch it. Yeah, now it goes away. Um, okay, so what was needed to make this work? Because what's happening here is the, the learner goes to edX, it uh, goes to a page, let's say they're on the quiz page, it stores to our server what page they went to, so we have that locally. We give that to the model, we ask the model for the next page recommendation, it says go here, which let's say is a video, let's see what's it, recommended video one, and then the learner goes to uh, video one, so that gets added to uh, the database that they went to video one, ask the algorithm what's next, the quiz is next, but, and the, the recommendation is inserted here as the page loads, that's what this is showing. But the learner doesn't go to the video page, the learner goes to a, a book page, text three, and then we say, we still recommend going to the quiz. So that's the sequence um, uh, that these actions need to be orchestrated in. <clears throat> and a little tidbit for enabling real-time logging you can, of course, trivially send to a server by inserting some JavaScript, whatever the URL, URL is. But if any of you have gotten into the guts of edX and have wanted to identify the particular vertical that a learner is on, it's not in the URL, right? Because this is an Ajax request. Um, it's hidden. So you actually need to get this vertical identifier from the DOM. And you can hack the DOM and get this out. Um, it is actually documented, even though edX doesn't explicitly encourage you to do this. All right, and if you want the details, uh, you can go to the CAHLR repository on GitHub, and we have the code uh, for getting this information. So as the learner is interacting with the course, we're storing their activity on our database in anonymized uh, uh, user ID form. Um, and the web service is being queried to serve up that next page recommendation. Um, but essentially this all works, right? This was run live in a Delft edX course. Um, so we were able to get this real-time recommendation in there without any commits from edX code base, right? This is just inserting JavaScript code into every page of the course. So if you're a, a staff, you can, you, any staff of the course can do this. And for this message here, we wanted to figure out how we should say this. Should, should we say recommendation? That sounded too authoritative. We didn't want to say recommendation. So instead we went with suggestion, but we also wanted to give the impression of personalization, that this isn't just a random page or a random piece of extra work you should do. This is for you. So we went with for you. <clears throat> and before we said, here's a suggestion, click go, and learners didn't like that they weren't being told what go was going to, and so we added uh, a description of what we were suggesting, which meant keeping a catalog of lookups between the vertical index we were using and just the semantic name of, of that course page, which wasn't too hard, but it, it was important to add. Uh, so to replicate this is uh, data-wise, what you need is access to your 
uh, event logs uh, for the model to be trained on the previous offering, uh, access to your course XML um, so that the names of the course pages can be inserted along with the recommendation, um, and then um, also uh, this copy of the HTML JavaScript snippet, which both sends logging data to the server and asks for a recommendation. That snippet, which I had the GitHub link to, just gets inserted into every course page, and then you have that. <clears throat> so another example of adaptation um, based on a path through course is how you can adapt communication. I showed how to adapt syllabus diversion suggestions. Um, here's how you might uh, adapt communication. And um, you know, one of the benefits of one-on-one -on -one tutoring that has at times been shown to have uh, a high um, uh, positive effect com compared to one-on-many instruction um, is that you get this one-on-one -on -one high bandwidth communication that's personalized. So you can imagine this personalization or communication personalization spectrum where you have less personalized and more personalized forms of communication, one-on-one -on -one being the, mo the most personalized. Um, <clears throat> but the, the typical communication in a course, online or otherwise, tends to be here. Um, certainly online, uh, in a MOOC, where it's an announcement to the entire class. That's what edX lets you do, send emails to everybody. Um, on the other side, um, you could send individual emails um, post individual discussion board replies. I rarely see instructional staff and MOOCs post their email. You're just kind of inviting people to kill your inbox. Um, but that would be more personalized. It's not as high bandwidth as one-on-one, -on -one, but you could do that. So the idea was to come up with something that would provide instructors something in between, something not as onerous as giving out their email and responding to all individual emails they receive, but something more personalized than just sending blanket emails to everybody. Um, but then not just to engineer this hypothetically, but to create a proof of concept on edX uh, that allows uh, instructors to do this. 